Um, Kristen, I think um, we have uh, everybody. Once Audrey's promoted, we will have the folks needed for the next item. Okay. Great. We have all, and we have everybody back. Yeah, and, and Sarah is also here. Yeah, I see Sarah. Mm -hmm. And Novella and Stephanie. Okay. Great. Uh, are we, um, Shannon, are we back? Rolling? Yes, we are. We're okay. Good. Okay, welcome back everyone from uh, lunch. Um, we're gonna continue on with our agenda. Um, the next item, um, we're gonna talk about the uh, update on the Blue Ribbon Commission, the future of the bar exam. I think that Audrey and Amy are both here and have a presentation um, for us. And then I know I will have comments and my guess is that Sarah will also have comments. And then we will of course take comments from the rest of COAP. Thank you, Kristen. I'm gonna share my screen. So we do have a slideshow. Um, thank you for inviting us to speak today. We wanna provide you an update on the Blue Ribbon Commission after the May board meeting. Um, I'm Audrey Ching and Amy Nunez. You've seen us here before with these updates. Um, just a brief overview um, in case we haven't covered this before. The Blue Ribbon Commission was formed by the Supreme Court and the State Bar Board of Trustees. Um, the commission ended up meeting 19 times from 2021 to 2023, which was uh, perhaps more than anticipated when it was first established, but there was a lot to do. We had our final meeting uh, April 26, 2023, after um, all the public comment was, re was received. We had almost 900, I think it was 867. Um, commenters making over 1,400 comments. So there was a lot of um, aggregation of comments and trends of the comments that were reviewed by the commission at that April meeting. Um, and we made some decisions, as you'll see um, in Amy's slides, uh, uh, some changes from the public comment period as well. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I just want to remind everybody the charter that um, uh, the directive from the Supreme Court um, to the Blue Ribbon Commission was to um, determine whether a bar exam was a correct tool to determine minimum competence, uh, if the uh, if the uh, whether we should adopt the uh, the National Conference of Bar Examiners Uniform Bar Exam, and if that was not part of the adoption. Um, and that California should explore their own exam, uh, whether the, we needed recommendations on the legal topics, the skills to be tested. And so um, here, what you see before you is where the commission landed on those determinations. So essentially the commission recommended that uh, California develop its own exam and rejected uh, adopting the National Conference of Bar Examiners next gen exam. And some of the uh, primary reasons for that is um, that it would allow California to have greater flexibility in policy considerations related to the, the exam if it did not adopt the next gen exam. Uh, and these policy decisions could be like whether to test remotely or not, also whether we could offer the exam more than twice a year as, as it's currently uh, uh, being offered. Also that California con uh, specific content would not be covered in the next gen exam. Uh, such as the California Code of Civil Procedure, which is more complex. Um, also, the BRC was not able to view the next-gen bar exam sample questions, um, and that was a, a major consideration, too. Um, it, you know, that exam is still under development. Now, as for the uh, topic areas, the Blue Ribbon Commission uh, agreed to adopt the CAPA recommendations. And uh, just to remind everybody, the CAPA was a California practice analysis that was conducted uh, prior to uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission that looked and studied what um, the minimum competence should be uh, uh, and what is required at a minimum for entry level attorneys. Uh, there were eight different topic areas that were part of that recommendation. After the public comment period, a ninth um, category was added. So as you can see here, the eight legal topic, uh, uh, initial legal topics were included, everything you see here from administrative law and procedure to torts. And then um, post that meeting, a uh, post public comment period, professional responsibility was added. 
Um, as for um, also uh, during the public comment period, we received questions about uh, a, what it, what is in, in, uh, intended uh, when we talked about a California specific exam, uh, and we wanted to add language to um, specify that uh, the the topics themselves would contain to uh, California content, but also that there are some legal topics here that cover federal law, and so we made that distinction also um, in the language in the proposed language that uh, was developed after the public comment period. Um, all right, next slide. And so as for the uh, recommendations on the skills, again, the BRC um, uh, adopted the California, uh, the CAPA recommendations, and these are the skills that uh, are recommended to be incorporated uh, in the next exam. Um, so they include uh, drafting and writing, research and investigation, issue spotting and fact gathering, counsel advice, litigation, community uh, communication and client relationship, and negotiation and dispute resolution. On top of the um, uh, the topic areas, I think the commission also wanted to look at uh, exam, make a uh, recommendation on exam design. And here, uh, the recommendation is that if the Supreme Court adopted uh, the recommendation to develop a California bar exam, that uh, the state bar is does this under uh, in consultation with subject matter experts and other specialists and that the design should also be consistent with the guiding principles that were adopted by the Blue Ribbon Commission um, in their initial meetings, uh, which included crafting an exam that's fair, that is equitable, and that minimizes uh, disparate performance uh, based on race, gender, ethnicity, disability, or other immutable characteristics. So uh, that is what was incorporated in that recommendation. Also um, that uh, the, uh, the, the, there was further specification on the exam development that there should be increased focus on the assessment of skills, uh, it, that we de-emphasize memorization of doctrinal law. And as for the precise weight of how much of the exam should test knowledge versus skills, that that should be determined after the exam is developed. So that was incorporated in this uh, recommendation. Lastly, that there's transparency in, uh, on the topics and rules to be tested, meaning that we would probably provide uh, things like a um, content map as part of the preparation for taking that exam. Next slide, please. So. One of the uh, directives was also to look at how we treat out-of-state uh, attorneys, meaning should we allow out-of-state attorneys um, to have to sit and pass the California bar exam as we do today? So the Blue Ribbon Commission had to consider two policies to answer that question. The two policies uh, include reciprocity. So uh, reciprocity is where a jurisdiction allows applicants the ability to become licensed without requiring an exam, and that that access is also offered to, um, uh, to uh, both um, states, so for the incoming applicant and for the, um, for the state where the applicant is coming from. And comedy is uh, the practice where uh, it's a one-way uh, privilege so that uh, that privilege is extended to that incoming applicant, regardless of whether that privilege is extended to uh, uh, constitu constituents from that incoming state. And so um, this was uh, a, a big point of, of discussion, along with uh, an embedded policy within this. Can we go to the next screen, please? Here, um, jurisdictions, um, one of the considerations is uh, that California has a different uh, framework. So one of the things that um, that we is different about California compared to other states is that people can meet their education requirements by uh, school, by not simply attending uh, ABA schools. We also have non-ABA schools, that is law schools that are uh, accredited by the California State Bar or registered with the California State Bar and monitored by um, uh, the California State Bar, and uh, and some of those are not, most of those are not recognized around the state. Um, as well as our law office um, study program, we have applicants that can, um, licensee applicants that can satisfy that education requirement by studying under a judge or under an attorney for a specific, specific amount of time in order to meet their um, uh, legal education requirement. 
And so one of the things that uh, we developed um, to help guide some of this conversation is this map here. Um, as you can see here, uh, we have, uh, there's two concepts that are uh, charted here, reciprocity and comedy, and then also uh, the jurisdictions that um, allow non-ABA and ABA law schools, uh, uh, law school graduates um, reciprocity. So despite uh, adopting a reciprocity or non-reciprocity or a comedy uh, policy, one of the considerations and the, the, some of the feedback that we got from our public comment period was how do we uh, allow or what position does the BRC have on whether ABA approved law school students should be part of the process? Um, so like, uh, are we uh, concerned with non-ABA uh, law school graduates being allowed to participate um, in a reciprocity model? Um, so where we and landed, and we could go to uh, uh, slide 16, please, um, is the recommendation that was made was uh, the BRC voted to adopt reciprocity and a reciprocity that included non-ABA attorneys um, and as well as law office study practice. So specifically, this was the recommendation that the Supreme Court revise the requirements for licensed out-of-state attorneys in good standing to be admitted to California without sitting for the bar exam, and that the licensing state provides the same privilege to California licensed attorneys, regardless of their educational background, and based on a certain number of years of practice. Uh, the minimum number of years um, uh, is gonna be determined, um, you know, uh, as, along with the demonstration of ethical and competent practice. And as for uh, determination on foreign attorneys and foreign educated applicants, uh, the decision was to uh, uh, determine that after the new bar exam has been implemented. So uh, those were the decisions that were made um, related to the bar exam pathway. Thank you, Amy. So, um, oops. A little recap on the bar exam alternative. Um, as Amy mentioned, part of the charter was to um, think about whether or not a bar exam, traditional bar exam, is the best or only tool to establish minimum competence. So the uh, group over those 19 meetings, some of them were in subcommittees on um, initially what was called a non-exam pathway, but um, changed to be called a bar exam alternative because some of the pathways considered aren't a traditional bar exam, but did include exams. So we're, we're calling it a bar exam alternative um, in the final report. So considerations for a bar exam alternative were how would minimum competence be demonstrated, right? If it's not a traditional bar exam, then what, what would um, take the place of that? How could consistency across law school types and law office study programs be achieved? How would fairness and equity considerations be implicated as measured by questions of affordability and access? And that was back to those guiding principles as well. How would an alternative, alternative pathway scale in California? And would this pathway be applicable to all candidates seeking licensure or some sort of subset or pilot? Um, the three main components that the group looked at over time were what happens in law school? Is there going to be a modification to the program of legal education, more experiential um, learning, more clinics, more internships or externships? Um, and then the supervised practice. So under a licensed attorney, um, some amount of time, uh, the Canadian jurisdictions that talked to the group, uh, all of the provinces, had between eight and 12 months of supervised practice. They call it articling in Canada. So would that work out to a certain amount of hours? Can you do some of the supervised practice hours in law school or would it be all post-graduation? These were some of the considerations that were discussed. And then what would the assessment piece? And again, not um, just calling it a non-exam pathway because one of the assessment options would be some sort of exam, um, maybe a just different style of exam, maybe all more like the performance test question that we have now in the bar exam, or would it be a work product review, portfolio, capstone, um, some sort of in-person workshop? So a lot of different options um, in uh, something different than a uh, traditional bar exam. Ultimately, though, the Blue Ribbon Commission did not reach a consensus on even exploring a bar exam alternative. 
several motions were proposed and you could read through them all in the report that was posted for the Board of Trustees um, and did not receive enough votes to move a recommendation forward um, in the final report. So the board action that did move forward and Amy covered it, a California de developed exam covering federal law and California law, the CAPA recommended topics, those eight topics plus professional responsibility, so now nine, the CAPA recommended skills, a focus on skills and application versus rote memorization, um, state bar staff and subject matter experts will be tasked with developing that exam, and then uh, as Amy just covered that reciprocity for attorneys from other states, regardless of educational background. So regardless of law school type or some manner of law office study, the um, motion included reciprocity for all educational backgrounds. These were the resolutions that were in the agenda item and that moved forward so that the final report and recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission, um, that the trustees approve the final report and recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission and that the report be transmitted to the Supreme Court with the uh, recommendation to adopt. Um, and what happened during the board meeting was the addition of this um, further resolved. So after a discussion about the bar exam alternative um, and that ha not having a consensus recommendation that moved forward, the Board of Trustees um, voted to add this uh, action to what was uh, moved forward that day. So there was a third resolution that the board directs staff to ask the Blue Ribbon Commission members who indicated support for a bar exam alternative. And if you see the report, you can read through the dissents um, and see which Blue Ribbon Commission members did write in in support of a Blue Ribbon, um, a bar exam alternative. Um, develop a proposal for this pathway, drawing on the guiding principles that were established by the group, all the deliberations and materials that um, were discussed over those many meetings, input from experts and other stakeholders that they identify, and then submit this proposal to the Board of Trustees either at the July or September 2023 meeting. So that is the um, latest and greatest update from the Commission, and I'm sure there's some questions. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. Um, and so uh, for those who don't um, recall, Ryan and I um, sat on the Blue Ribbon Commission for the last two and a half years um, and attended the 19 uh, or more meetings because there were subcommittee meetings as well. Um, and Ryan, um, Ryan is not here today. Uh, he and I spoke at length. Um, and um, I want to share with you all um, the comments that we made to Audrey, because we each made comments separately to Audrey, not knowing that the other person was making comments. Um, otherwise, I apologize, Audrey, we would have done it together. <clears throat> um, so it, it is the last part of the Board of Trustees resolution that troubles Ryan and I the most. Um, and that is specifically that the Board of Trustees is permitting the uh, a subset of the BRC to do something that the BRC itself did not agree to do, and in fact agreed not to do. Um, we spent, I, I will say, I was on the, uh, the Bar Exam Alternative uh, Subcommittee. Uh, Ryan was on the other subcommittee. Um, but we did all meet together uh, in the last, like what, year and a half, Audrey? Um, we all met together. Um, so both he and I spent quite a bit of time on this issue. And as we have talked about in COAF meetings before, um, Ryan and I were not in favor of the bar exam alternative pathway for all the reasons that, that we've talked about before and I, I won't belabor them now. Um, but, you know, I, I went into this neutral and so did Ryan, and we both, uh, in the end, came out in the same place, and that was that we didn't believe that a, that a bar exam alternative um, was something that COAF could be in support of the way that it was presented and based on the information that we received. And that was also the, the BRC's determination. We could not agree as a group to a non-exam, or I'm sorry, we won't call it a non-exam pathway, but that's what we were calling it for so long, the bar exam alternative pathway. The BRC could not come up with, um, with an agreement to support that. 
And, and so it is extremely troubling to Ryan and I that after spending two and a half years and reading thousands of pages of, of information and sitting through 19 or more meetings, that the board of trustees would decide to hear only from those people who were already in support of it to begin with and create um, and make a recommendation to the Supreme Court that isn't what the BRC itself is recommending. Um, and I, I'm just gonna say, you know, personally, and, and if Ryan were here, you all know Ryan well enough to know um, that Ryan would be speaking at length on this too. Uh, it is a bit insulting to have spent all of this time um, on this issue to have, you know, delved into uh, to bar exam alternatives in a handful of other states that do it, um, having read thousands of pages about the articling process in Canada. I, I certainly know more about how everyone becomes a lawyer um, than I ever thought uh, possible, but it feels a bit insulting. Uh, and um, and to, to have done all this work and have the board of trustees say, uh, thanks for all your hard work, but we only wanna hear from the people who are in favor of this. Um, and so um, Ryan and I both wrote to Audrey um, expressing our concern. I, I, I don't, um, I imagine that other people um, also wrote in because um, we were a bit surprised. The other concern that Ryan and I have is that, um, you know, this ultimately goes to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court's decision. And um, they're going to see what the BRC did, and then they're going to see what the Board of Trustees did. And um, and and I don't know that it, that, in my opinion, this is the that, that this is going to 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 land favorably, um, with with folks who know that um, this is not what the BRC itself voted on and what the BRC recommended. And we had folks from the Supreme Court sitting in in our meetings, so they know um, they know about this. Uh, so you know that that. That is where Ryan and I are on this. We both expressed our concern to Audrey um, that that this is not what we thought we were signing on for and certainly not what we thought um, was the charter. Um, I want, you know, I certainly wanna hear from folks if you have thoughts, um, but um, I also wanna make sure that I give time um, to Sarah on this, if she, if you want to be heard on it, because you know, as you all know, Sarah sat on COF with us um, and is now on the board of trustees. And I understand, Sarah, that you were at, you know, at the meeting. Um, and so I, I want, I want to give you time to be um, to to talk about this if you want. And of course, all of my anger is not at all directed at at, at you, but but at you know. Um, but but really, uh, it's a it's an overall frustration with um, with how this sort of went down in the end. So okay, so it's now a good time for for me to make some yes. remarks. Yeah, yes, great. Please. So first of all, I wanted to start by thanking Judge Rosie and Brian Harrison, who isn't here today, for all of the hard work that they did on the Blue Ribbon Commission. It was truly an astounding amount of work, a huge report that um, came down from it and really, you know, is going to really sort of revolutionize and reshape how we think about the bar exam in California. So I wanted to express my gratitude for all of the hard work that you did. And I know that um, you both feel very passionately about these issues and did a tremendous job. So thank you. Um, when it came before the Board of Trustees, and everything was approved, by the way, except for this one little thing, I think there was um, certainly a sentiment, and certainly I expressed a sentiment of disappointment that there was not um, an alternate pathway on the table that we could actually take a look at, um, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. There just was nothing there. 
Um, and my remarks at the meeting were to the effect of, can we keep studying this issue in the future, seeing what other jurisdictions are doing? Because I understand there are some alternate pathways underway in other jurisdictions. See what happens there and reconsider this, you know, down the road. Um, and uh, you'll be delighted to note, Judge Rosie, that I specifically singled out Ryan's comments and your comments that you felt that the, um, the proposals that were developed on this by the Blue Ribbon Commission would not advance making the profession more accessible um, to diverse folks and low income folks, but in fact would have the contrary effect. Um, there was also a tremendous number of commentators um, both in writing and then who showed up at the Board of Trustees um, meeting who expressed a contrary view um, to your and Ryan's view that they felt that accessibility in the legal profession would be advanced by having an alternate pathway. So there's quite a bit, you know, quite a range of sort of differences of view there. Um, so um, that's kind of how it came up. And I think other, other board members uh, wanted to see something um, in, in in particular and wanted to see kind of a proposal on the table that the Board of Trustees could look at and decide whether or not it goes to the Supreme Court or not. It's still an open question. Um, and I think, you know, just taking a step back and not perhaps looking at some of the specific proposals that the Blue Ribbon Commission looked at as a theoretical concept, having an alternate pathway could be a great thing, right? And could promote accessibility if done in the right way, right? Um, and um, so I think the Board of Trustees um, and myself included wanna see what, what's come up with, if it will advance it or if it won't. We'll talk about it at the meeting. And I think that um, to the extent that it's a rehash of something that you don't think is appropriate, you should certainly come and speak at the meeting and make that known. Um, um, to the to the trustees or or write in or you know do whatever appropriate process um, uh, is appropriate there, but that's a little bit of a backdrop on it. And I certainly wouldn't take this personally, Judge Rosie. Um, you know, it's about trying to do the right thing, right, and trying to consider the right thing. And I'm sure that even you yourself could come up with an alternate pathway that you would be happy with. Um, maybe just not one of the ones that the Blue Ribbon Commission considered, I'm gathering from your comments, so. Thanks, Sarah, for providing that, that backdrop. Um, do folks have um, questions um, or comments that they want to make uh, on this? Um, I, I just have a question. I think this is for Sarah about the logistics of, I don't know whether to call it the new working group or what to call it. It sounds like it's not part of the blue ribbon commission, but it's a separate state bar subcommittee, if that's fair to say. And I'm wondering about the timeline that's anticipated in terms of either developing a proposal that would go, if I understand your comments first to the board of trustees, and then potentially to the California Supreme Court. I can answer that because I've been- Yeah, I was to... gonna deflect it to Audrey. Yeah. <laughs> All right, perfect, <laughs> uh, thank you, time. Audrey. Pass me the ball. So um, I've been looking at this because I need to get those folks together for a kickoff meeting to start working on this proposal and then working backward from a timeline um, and looking that it's now already June, the timeline I'm working backward from at this point is the September board meeting. So um, I'm scheduling a, a kickoff meeting with those folks identified as um, in support of the bar exam alternative next week. And it's it's going, they, the idea is for that group to do the work and then the proposal um, gets reviewed by staff. There's also the thought that the proposal will also go out to the rest of the Blue Ribbon Commission to make comments. So it's a kind of, you know, um, more inclusive in that way. And then we'll get written into an agenda item um, for the September board meeting. So that's sort of the timeline that I am um, putting together. 
So just to clarify, is it going to the Board of Trustees and or the Supreme Court as part of a recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Commission, or is it separate from the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations? Uh, uh, good question. So it's, the Blue Ribbon Commission work is done, so it's not uh, coming from the Blue Ribbon Commission. But as part of the process, the idea is that the members who are not in the proposal bar exam proposal group will get to make comments on the um, alternative pr being proposed, but it won't be coming from the Blue Ribbon Commission. Okay, will COAF or any other committees have the opportunity to provide input on those recommendations either? Um, well, certainly Kristen and Ryan will be sent the proposal as part of this timeline to make their comments. Um, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure, probably within the cadence of meetings between now and the September board meeting, I would think there would be an opportunity to talk about what the proposal is shaping up to look like and what their comments are. We, we call if this have an August, a late August meeting, so that might be the, an opportunity. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, Audrey. And thank you, Sarah, for that background. I appreciate it. I, I also think, you know, it's, I mean, as I, as I said before, we've been doing this for two and a half years. So um, the, the timeline of, of meeting the September board meeting deadline and, and what alternatives are going to be uh, presented will likely be alternatives we already considered. And there's not a lot of time between, I, I mean, this is, you know, we, we've been talking about this for so long and we, you know, personally been talking about a non- exam pathway or a bar exam alternative for, for two and a half years now. So I don't think that, I, I can't imagine that there's going to be a lot of new work done. My, my, what, what I envision or at least imagine, and maybe I'm wrong, is that what um, the board of trustees will see from, from those folks who are in favor of, of the non-exam pathway um, will be, um, stuff that the BRC already saw and, and voted uh, not to support, so. I think the only um, addition to that would be that since we started meeting till now, Oregon's, um, right. they have a supervised practice pathway and uh, experiential pathway for their law schools. That's actually in like draft rules that, that are, right, so like the things funny. that where we started talking about it in Blue Ribbon are now uh, much, uh, further developed. And then the Minnesota Board of Law Examiners have had three working groups um, on like the sort of what we were doing, like the next gen or no, and then like a supervised practice and then uh, working with the law schools on experiential pathways. So that that we didn't, that was happening sort of in a way that didn't even catch some of our, so some of the, some of the other jurisdictions that have these pathways moving forward to their boards in court, I think that those things are a little more fleshed out that we didn't have the um, ability to look at in like more formal like rule sets. So I think some of that might be helpful in the um, drafting of the proposal. And that would be my recommendation to the group is to have, you know, have some of those folks um, preview some of those things that are more almost, you know, up to approval by their courts in those jurisdictions. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to, to mention that it's, it's away from the non-exam pathway now, um, and that's the um, reciprocity issue because that is also something that that Ryan and I spent some time talking about. Um, and you saw from Audrey's uh, and um, Amy's presentation that um, that what was ultimately um, talked about and recommended is this idea that um, you have to take everyone from California. Um, into if you're you know in, in that you, you we're, if we're going to give it to you you have to take everyone um and, and there was concern that that will um from members of the public and and from and ryan and i talking about it that that will actually make it more difficult for uh from folks from california because um we are one of only what two states that have non aba law schools um, and that the um, that if other states don't want to take our non-ABA graduates, um, then the rest of the state attorneys who went to ABA schools will also uh, lose out um, on getting that reciprocity. So um, 
Ryan wanted me to touch on that um, as well, just to let sort of flag that for folks. Um, because that wasn't something that we thought we were going to be dealing with initially either, but uh, it did come up. Uh, yes, I can't tell. Is that is that she used shellac? Is that you? shellac? Okay, good. Yeah. It, you're all back. Forgive, <laughs> forgive my ignorance. Um, Audrey may be able to say, or you might know, kind of offhand. Under the current model, what's what are the states with whom California has reciprocity? Because I didn't we think there was no anyone. Rest. Yeah, no, currently right? no one exactly. So okay, this is a I just radical change for the court yeah. to. Um, and you know who who knows what the court will do with the recommendations? You know, right. yeah, they could change no it one. to just say. ABA schools instead of educational but all backgrounds because and it's not just the non ABA schools we have law office study too which is a small percentage but that is something that uh, also not a lot of st states do anymore I think everyone used to do it in the 1800s right <laughs> well we like to be modern yeah. yeah there are other things that we are going back to the 1800s on so perhaps right um, that might be one as well I apologize Sometimes that should not have been made <laughs> comment. But I was just curious because I just wondered, you know, like if it's not something happening now, I don't know if for the uh, BRC, there was a little bit of like, well, you already don't get that benefit. So is it worth pushing that forward? Like if that was part of it. So if uh, if someone is making the choice now to take the California bar as it sits today, they're doing so knowing that if they want to go to any other jurisdiction, they're going to have to do another bar exam. And I'm just wondering if the BRC was like, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type thing. Like, and I just wondered where that might have sat in your deliberations as it came to reciprocity and comedy. So, so I, I will just, I just say, like I said, um, you know, jokingly a minute ago, I didn't know we were going to be talking about that. Uh, I think it came out of a conver of the conversation of we're here talking about um, what we're going to do with the California bar exam and, and that subgroup, which Ryan was in, you know, decided we're not going to use the UBE for all the reasons that that uh, Amy talked about um, before. And so it felt like, a mo I guess, a moment in time where we were all there talking about, about a, sort of a, a, a new California bar exam. Did we also want to look at um, this, this issue? Uh, and, and certainly lots of folks and, um, and, and Audrey can tell you that a significant amount of the, of the public comment that we got, and it was a lot of public comment, um, a lot of public comment focused on what we were gonna test with the new California. And the other part focused on this issue of, of reciprocity and comedy. Um, and um, people felt really strongly about, you know, if we're gonna do a California only exam, um, do we want to use this opportunity to get California lawyers reciprocity in other places. Um, I, I don't know if ultimately what we came up with is gonna is going to make any difference. It may it may be that we adopt this the rule and and everybody else says, well, we're not letting all these people from California in because they didn't all go to ABA schools or some of them, you know, studied um, at home, and um, so we're not going to let those folks in so we're not letting anybody in it may it may be that we we spent a lot of time discussing it for and having um made no real uh headway in it but it it did feel like uh something that that we weren't that i didn't particularly understand we were going to be talking about and then it became a really big issue at the end like within the last like six to eight months it became a, a big issue and audrey maybe I think part of it is because if we were electing not to do the next gen, which is the, the new name for UBE, then all the states that have the UBE now and go to next gen, they have score portability. So it's similar to reciprocity where if you meet the cut score right to the state you want to be barred in, you can port your UBE score into that state. And obviously you have to meet all the other criteria for admission. Um, but if we if we say we're California is not going to do next gen, then portability being off the table for our applicants, that is kind of the genesis of, well, then maybe we should uh, push to reciprocity. Okay, thank you. Heather has a question. Is yes, Heather, I'm portability sorry. different from comedy? 
Um, yeah, comedy is, is when a state decides that regardless of whatever any other state decides, we will allow X, Y, Z, you know, we'll allow you to um, be admitted on. So motion. there's not a cut score. It's just, right. like it's your just, box. you're a, a barred attorney from wherever, then we're, we're good. You can <laughs> get admitted on. Motion. Okay. So I just want to clarify on something Shalak said. So while we don't offer, California does not offer reciprocity with anyone, there yeah. are states that offer comedy to California barred lawyers, because you, when you just said like people who take the bar in California now know, do it with the understanding that they might not get reciprocity, but they may get comedy in other states. We just yeah. don't provide, we don't provide the reciprocity back yeah. from those, and those states, right? I just- Very few states that would do that are, are for ABA only yeah. too, so. Mm -hmm. It's a little different. The, the very few states that do that are for, is that what you just said? Yeah. It must be ABA. Or for ABA only, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there are very few, I think. I can't remember from the graph, but I think there aren't that. There Texas aren't. is one, I think, right? That offers comedy for us. No, I don't yeah. think so. I don't think so. I don't think it was I, Huh, okay. And I think Texas is with a minimum amount of practice right. experience. That's true. I thought. So, what is that called? One. <laughs> Where does that fall? Is, that's not a cut score. That's not just comedy, no matter what. Like, what happens if there's a minimum requirement of a certain amount of years of practice? What category is that? I think, still, I think that is comedy because you can still, still be admitted comedy. on motion. Yeah. Um, but I think that's right that it's with a certain amount. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. I was just curious. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's I think it's Texas with uh, Washington. I think I'm looking at Amy's map. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, Iowa, yeah. a couple other states. Thank you, Audrey. Okay. Uh, anything else on um, this? Um, certainly, Ryan and I will bring back uh, to the next meeting um, anything that we see. So. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I do have one question. This is yes. more personal curiosity, Audrey. Do you have a sense of implementation timeline? So say the Supreme Court does adopt what the BRC has put in in full, or Sarah may have insight into this. Is there a sense that this would be okay? And then there would be one year given to develop this. There would be 10 years, <laughs> you know, like. That's a good question. And I think that would be something because along parallel to whatever might happen is we have to develop a new exam. Right. And with the, the exam timeline, I know a little more because the, the NCBE will stop giving us the, this version of the exam by like, um, uh, I think it's like February, 2027 or something. So we have like, to, and we have to give law schools two years notice of changes to the exam so they can start preparing students. So yeah. our like working backward, we also have to get the exam development committee, those subject matter experts. We talked about this new style of questions that don't require memorization. So there's gonna be an implementation on of something with the bar exam alternative on top of the uh, new exam. So I think um, resource wise and um, just the, constraints of space and time, we would have to work out. Yeah, we would have to probably work out more than a year, I would think of implementation, unless, unless there's a decision to do a small pilot, which is something that could happen. And that um, Kristen will know the group talked about all sorts of different pilots. And we had a lot of public comment from um, Claire Salat, who works with the legal, oh, LSFN, I'm going to- Legal, legal Services, legal services yes. Fund Network. Right, about maybe that being a perfect pilot. So who, who knows in terms of what might, be the the way to scale it up in the proposal. Okay. My question was in thinking about how all of this intertwines with pipelines into the profession, right? Like when we're thinking about early pipeline videos, encouraging people at the undergraduate, I mean, the four year or community college or beyond and encouraging people from diverse groups and first gen and all of that to be thinking about the profession the bar exam is something they think about. So being able to sort of give real, real solid direction or support to those who might be thinking about the profession and who may hear about some of this and be like, oh, so does that mean that if I decide to start law school in three years, I'm not going to have to take a bar. Maybe I should defer or, you know, and I think that does become important when we think about people who are considering this as a profession. So just something else to keep in mind. 
Thanks a lot. Um, anybody else? Okay. Uh, thank you, Audrey. And I think Amy left already. <laughs> we, had, we had so many, we're juggling on it. Okay. Phrase. All right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and um, for all your hard work, because uh, it's not just Ryan and I, it's really Hugh and Amy who've been doing the heavy lifting for, uh, and Devin for the, for the last two and a half years on this. So thank you. Oh, that. Well, thank you. It's actually been a wonderful, engaging process and it continues to be. <laughs> and it continues. Um, just when you thought it was over. Okay. Um, all right. Moving on um, to 6.8 on our agenda, an update on uh, proposed amendments to Rule 9.7. And I saw the fantastic Kathy Ongary, and there she is. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? You can. Okay, yes. so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint to help guide the conversation. Okay, let me just make sure I get it the right slideshow. And I will let you know that once I go into slideshow mode, I can't see anybody or anything. So if you have questions or concerns, let me swap it. If you have questions or concerns, just please feel free to interrupt me at, um, you know, an opportune time that works for everybody. Okay, great. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the recommended amendments to the rule of court 9.7 um, of the rules of professional, sorry, and the rules of professional conduct, the changes that are going to be affected by the California Civilities Task Force recommendations. And I didn't introduce myself, but Judge Rosie took the uh, benefit of doing that for me. But I'm Kathy Ongiri. I'm the managing attorney in the Office of Professional Competence here at the State Bar. Okay, so I am going to go into a little, I presented to you last in December, I believe, and I am going to go into a little bit more detail today, just to explain kind of some of the recent actions from the Board of Trustees meeting that was held uh, about two weeks ago, and um, the next steps, because these things have gone out for an additional round of public comment. Okay, so as you recall, um, the California Civility Task Force issued four recommendations to increase and promote civility in the legal profession. Three of them were specific to attorneys, and one was requiring an hour of MCLE. The second one was requiring the take the pledge or the oath, the civility oath. And the third is to revise the rules of professional conduct to address incivility. So let's start off with rule, the rule of court 9.7. And so basically this is what the current form is, right? Since 2014, all licensees had to take um, this oath with the civility language. Uh, last time I spoke to you, I said that the numbers, we have about 150,000 active licensees. Um, and they, those are the ones who took the, well, no, we have, I'm sorry, let me back up. We have approximately 237,000 licensees, 150 of them, thousand of them are active, but they took the oath without the civility language, okay? So we have a bunch of people that have not taken this language, and what we initially issued for public comment um, was changes to the oath for attorneys who had not already completed it, um, and then the special admissions attorneys. But, and then on an annual basis, they would be required to um, affirm the commitment, okay? Um, so when we went out for public comment, this is the results. So we received uh, 60 comments specifically on this proposal. There was approximately 52% agreeing, 8% agreeing if modified, and 40% disagreeing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what the comments, what what the the agreements or disagreements were about. So in terms of the themes, most of the comments that disagreed with the proposed recommendations um, or agreed if modified stated that the changes to the civility oath is not going to have any real impact to increase civility in profession. Um, what is uncivil is too vague or subjective, and incivility can be addressed in other ways, such as a you know, judge or court staff. 
Now, other comments stated that it would the changes would be burdensome and that attorneys were already overly regulated um, so that the requirements would be a waste of resources and that the state bar should focus on attorney discipline. So those were the people who disagreed. Now, the people who agreed um, stated that they thought that, you know, this is going to have a positive impact and would improve civility in the profession, that the changes would help judges do their job by and coupled with the MCLE requirement, reducing the number of instances where judges must intervene to correct attorney conduct, and that the changes will um, kind of level the playing field so that all attorneys have this same commitment to civility. Now, after public comment, we did make a few changes um, just because there was some um, internal kind of implementation issues that we kept that we that we came up with. Um, so we didn't we're not recommending any changes on the actual language, but we do need to recommend um, basically the implementing changes. So we did make a few changes that require it to go back out for public comment. So as you can see here, uh, there will be the proposed new state bar rule 2.32 implement these things. And let's see, mm, okay, let, one more time, one more slide. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the, do we have any questions on the, on the rule of court or is everybody kind of clear on that? There's a bunch of pieces to this though. So. I don't see anybody's hands. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about the rules of professional conduct. Now, in terms of these, we did pr propose three different changes. Um, one is to Rule 1.2, which deals of, with the allocation of authority. I'll, I'll, I'll go into these a little bit more, but just so you're aware of what these comments are based on. Um, and then the Rule 8.4, which is the misconduct rule. And then a new standalone rule that is being proposed um, to address civility, and that's going to be Rule 8.4.2. So in terms of these... oh. Excuse me. So in terms of these, we received 65 comments. And then for the proposals, the majority of the commenters agree with the rules as proposed, but I'll talk a little bit more in depth as we go through each of the different kind of uh, aspects of the rules. So here's the allocation of authority rule. This is rule 1.2. And of the 65 comments that we received, uh, 42 agreed with it five agreed if modified and 17 disagreed and one took a uh, no position. And so most of the comments um, agreeing with the rule were in support of adding amendments um, as part of the overall kind of rule changes regarding civility. And the comments that disagreed with the over, they pretty much disagreed with the overall concept of adding civility as a component of the requirements. So it's kind of the same, a little bit of the same types of uh, disagreement that I mentioned earlier. And on this one, the California Access to Justice Commission recommended revisions to clarify that a lawyer um, retains the authority to agree to reasonable responses of opposing counsel and also the self-represented parties. So that, so we agreed with that recommendation and we've added that to the proposed amendments. So let's talk about rule 8.4 misconduct, the misconduct rule. So of this rule, uh, we the 34 people agreed with it, 10 agreed if modified, 20 disagreed, and one took no position. So similar to the responses for rule 1.2, most of the comments were in general support. Um, the opponents uh, similarly disagreed with just the concept of adding civility as a component of the rules. Now, of the specific revisions recommended to comment four of rule 0.84, commenters recommended that we cross-reference this new standalone rule, which, um, which is the 8.4.2, and to clarify that there is a separate basis for discipline in 8.4 sub D and 8.4.2. Um, Sorry, I know that's a mouthful, um, but we agreed with these changes. And so we've revised and incorporated this. And this is a uh, part of the updated rule that's an out for public comment. And then we also did, there's a few revisions to the um, comments. 
And this is 8.4. When the civility rule, when the rules initially went out, um, there was this clause that it was unprofessional conduct that is harassing in the practice of law or related professional activities. So that related um, professional activities came up in a number of comments. And what we've decided to do is strike that and narrow it because um, there were some First Amendment concerns um, about restricting people's conduct surrounding the related professional activities. So, and this is also a recommendation that we'll be making for 8.4.2, which I'll discuss momentarily. Um, and now there were a few other changes that were made just to clarify that the comment provides examples of conduct that on its own would not violate the rule, but that, and also changes were made that the, um, to recommend that the lawyer should consult with all relevant legal authorities, including the local rules of court and the bar association's codes of civility. So you'll see that that's the um, bolded language there. So now on to 8.4.2, as you can see, that's where the, um, of this one, 34 people agreed, 11 agreed if modified, 20 disagreed, and 20 disagreed. Um, so several of the commenters, uh, they were, they indicated their support um, provided by Justice Curry, who was the chair of the civility, the task force. Um, but most of the commenters, uh, were in support and they described how incivility negatively affects access to justice and that it would be appropriate for there to be re repercussions for incivility and that it should be a disciplinable, disciplinable offense. Um, some commoners did caution that the state bar will need to ensure that the rule is not disproportionately applied to attorneys um, that it's intended to protect. Uh, based on the prejudice, stereotypes, and the biases of the individuals reporting the alleged incivility um, or those investigating and prosecuting it. And that, I mean, in the civility, in the task force report, I think they really do call that out. Um, and that is going to be something that we are definitely going to have to keep a close watch on, you know, the, the link between incivility and bias um, and how it can be used as a weapon against people from... Um, underrepresented communities. Um, and then in terms of the opponents for this, uh, they, again, disagreed just with the concept of adding civility as a requirement. Um, a lot of commenters stated that the rule is too broad and that it's vague or subjective and that it may have a chilling effect. Um, again, the rule that the rule could potentially be weaponized um, specifically against zealous advocates, criminal defense attorneys, and those it's in intended to protect. Now, um, there was a change, as I mentioned, the, we struck the related professional activities there, and that was based on the first, um, actually, this re revision came from Justice Curry at, in his capacity as the chair of the task force. Um, and it was the First Amendment concerns as well. So we agreed with that and then we made the changes. So there was also a few made changes made to the comments um, for 8.4.2. And these are the ones that were kind of already similar to scribe, uh, the ones I described in 1.2 and 8.4, the, uh, the misconduct rule. And they provide clarifying like what authorities a lawyer should look to for guidance, clarifying that certain conduct on its own would not violate the rule, and that clarifying that the conduct could, that violates this rule could also violate the general misconduct rule, the 8.4 sub D, um, and that the rule does not apply to conduct nor speech. So those were the changes that we made. So in terms of the next steps for this, we are requesting a 30 day public comment. And after we go through the next round of public comment, we will take it back to the board to review. Um, and if the board approves it, then it would require the Supreme Court to adopt it with the exception of the one state bar rule, which is the implementing rule. 
And then, yeah, so that's kind of the steps with the civility stuff. But I also wanted to talk to you today about what's happening with the MCLE changes, because they kind of go hand in hand. And last time I was before you, I talked about both. So I figured I would go ahead and take advantage and let you know all the great stuff that we're doing um, and really encourage you to let your networks know that this stuff is out for public comment. So if anybody wants to um, give their feedback, we want to hear it. So please um, send out our public comment link to people. And if you have comments on your own, definitely please provide them as well. Okay, so now in terms of attorney credit hour requirements um, and eligibility for MCLE credit, um, there were a number of changes that we proposed, and that was the competency to increase it to two hours and add an hour that would be concerning attorney wellness. We would add an hour that would propose a um, technology requirement that uh, kind of goes along with the competency rules. And then that's and then the civility rule, the civility requirement, which I talked about based off of the uh, task force recommendations. So we um, we didn't seek any changes to these requirements, um, but there were some other changes that we are requesting. So we went out back out for public comment on the next things I'll be talking about. And then once we come back from that, we will ask the board to adopt everything in one comprehensive package. So the, this is one of the proposed changes that has required us to go back out for um, public comment. And this is the proposed um, rule 2.84. And this is a rule that would allow attorneys to get credit for participating in mock trial activities. Currently, people can get credit for, um, like if you're doing law school, then you could potentially get credit, although it's not explicitly written into our MCLE kind of codes. So this would expand it and it would allow, um, when we initially went out, it was just at the high school and um, collegiate and law school level. Um, but when we went out for public comment, we got back, we got 113 comments just about this mock trial rule. So people were really um, excited about this. And they recommended, though, that we also, that it go down to the middle school level. We had 44 of the 113, 44 specifically requested this middle school. And then um, the California Lawyers Association recommended that we, uh, that we explicitly call out all the graduate levels and the negotiation competitions, arbitration, and uh, the mediation competitions so that people can also get credit for those because they're akin to mock trial. So those were the expansions, and that's what's out for public comment um, in terms of the rules that are going to be affecting attorneys. Now, I, I will talk a little bit about the, okay, these are, these are the next steps, and I just kind of mentioned these. So 30 days public, public um, comment, please encourage people to make comments on these. Um, and then we did make some changes to the MCLE provider rules and fees. This may not be as, um, it's pretty technical, so I'm not sure if how in depth the group wants me to go, but I'll go through it really, I'll try to go through it quickly. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of the fee increases, um, we did, we, okay, we did a bunch of targeted outreach, okay, we requested, we did research on what other jurisdictions charge for fees for the MCLE providers specifically, um, and then we we did make changes to the rules that went out for public comment. And then once we heard back from public comment, we made a bunch of changes. Um, so here there was, um, so the current provider management system that the state bar has, there's been some concerns about it. And so based off of those concerns, we've withdrawn a number of proceed, a number of the proposals that we had. Um, so let's talk about all these. Uh, okay, let me just, sorry, I just jumped ahead a little bit. Okay, so there were, in terms of these rules, there were 25 public comments, and most everybody opposed these comments, um, they, and these were mostly the MCLE providers. Um, 
And so they basically, what it would, it basically resulted in them saying it would re require significant more monitoring of attorney behavior um, and that it's already being regulated through the MCLE rules that attorneys are following. And um, it felt like it was shifting some of the burden to the providers. And that was not our intention. Um, and so we listened to what the public, public comment said and we made some changes based on it. Um, okay, so here we, we wanted to change the renewal process for multiple activity providers from three to two years. And that was in line to be um, in line with other jurisdictions. And um, the lower application fee and renewal fees for nonprofit providers, we definitely want to ensure that they're still able to provide high quality MCLE programming. And then the pro proposed new late fees, that was the other thing that we kind of um, went out for to see what people thought about that. So as you can see, they weren't that popular, but we listened. <laughs> and then here, these are just the different fees. I don't think this group really um, has a really in-depth interest about this, but just so you kind of have an idea of what the current rate was, what was what's been approved, and then the nonprofit. So you'll see that there was some changes, and um, we've tried to take in. Uh, into account the variety of concerns. Mm -hmm. Oh, so we have a question, Shalak. Okay. Um, my question was whether or not any of the public comment was related to a chilling effect on MCLE being provided by like nonprofit organizations or those that may be interested in providing credit specifically around the elimination of bias or sort of diversity related ones. So not like the larger, you know, whatever scale people, but smaller bar associations or individuals who may put something together or be getting into it and be have a concern that it's a chilling effect on those who may want to provide some of those more specialized trainings. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And we didn't receive, we didn't receive any comments um, in terms of that, in, in terms of that. Um, okay. Yeah, I reviewed, okay. I reviewed all the public comments uh, at least five times. And <laughs> I, and that concern wasn't raised. Um, okay. And I mean, and I, what, I think that, and what we've kind of found through our research is that our fees have been pretty stagnant and other jurisdictions are actually charging a lot more. Um, and so we we want to keep that in mind. And I mean, we don't want to price anybody out of the market, of course, but we do want to be competitive and we do want to make sure, um, as you all are aware, with all the scrutiny on the bar about being fiscally responsible, you know, we feel that it's time that these fees have to go up. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah, but no, I didn't get that specific cup comment, but if I get it this round, I will definitely reach out to you and let you know. <laughs> you might you might I see a line not. in the board agenda item calling it out. So <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and so here are the kind of the general um the general comments that I talked about earlier that was impractical, it's really difficult. Um, and then it would impose unnecessary administrative and financial burdens. And, and that was, and a lot of that came specifically from the nonprofits and the smaller um, MCLE or the specialized MCLE providers. So we really, really kind of took that to heart. Um, and we went, we went ahead and withdrew quite a bit of the proposed amendments. And then we revised the proposed amendments based on comments to the specific rules. So let's see. So what we withdrew is this, uh, there was a self-study rule that would um, reduce the amount of time they would have to, um, that self-study materials would be, um, would still be able to be used basically. So we withdrew that. Um, what's the next one? 36 uh, rule three six hundred um, sub D K subdivision K. It had definitions for non traditional um, MCLE format. We removed that. I mean, some of the language is just a little bit dated. And with COVID, I think we're all seeing that our rules maybe all you know we need to rethink some things, reimagine some things. Um, and then we withdrew three point six zero one zero, and that was a paragraph that talked about the activities should be free of interruptions. Um, and that the goal of that was basically at times when 
law firms were holding MCLEs, they may not necessarily have made their associates completely available for the MCLEs. So that was is what that was intended to get at. However, in this virtual world, you know, providers can't are not going to install like facial monitoring software or you know, or require people to put their phones away and stuff like that. So that was withdrawn. Um, and that had actually been a longstanding requirement that was already in the rules. Um, so we were anticipating uh, the concerns, but we definitely hear them and we withdrew that. The next one is 3601 sub DP. And that one was to verify that the attorney must complete the entire MCLE session. And then 3602C, yeah, C, it was regarding the attendance records and when these providers needed to submit them. So those were the ones that we withdrew. And now the ones that are still going to be out are 3602D and E. And those were clarified to, um, they clarified the distinction between the certificate of attendance and a certificate of completion. Um, that is provided for the attorneys, and we put information on each of those in that in those sections. 3609, um, that one requires that, okay, so this is similar to the self-study one, but what this rule did is, what we heard a lot for self-study is we were asking to change the recertification from three to two years, and what people were saying is that some of this information is still really relevant and it shouldn't need to be, it shouldn't automatically be um, not eligible for MCLE credit. So what the 3609 does, it, it allows them to certify that they've reviewed all their self-study um, materials within 12 years of their um, application to renew their multiple activity provider status. And then, oops, 3610, 3.610, excuse me, um, it further clarifies the requirements for providers who want to become um, multi-activity providers in legal specialties. And then 3611 is um, a rule that will allow for the implementation of the board approved fees, um, including allowing different fees for, for profit and nonprofits. Um, or governance providers and to allow for late fees. So those are the ones that, that have gone back out for public comment. I know I gave you a lot of information, um, but the next steps are, they will be out until June 23rd. Once that comes back, we will be seeking an adoption of all of these kind of proposed rules. And, um, and that's pretty much it. So do we have any questions? Let me stop sharing. Um, so I, yes, I know I threw a lot of information at you and I've been in this information for a long time. So there may be questions um, and I'm really, I'm happy to answer them. And I would, I thank you for allowing me to come back. Hopefully I can come back and tell you all the great stuff that ha that the board did adopt. Um, at, I, I, assuming that they do <laughs> assumptions. Um, so yeah. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. Uh, Heather, did you have a question? I saw your Yes, please. Thank you, Kathy. That was excellent. Um, I had a question about the reasoning behind the credit for the mock trial and moot court activities. Like why those select activities for credit versus other things? What, what are we trying to accomplish there? Well, so we had received, we have been receiving a lot of um, kind of letters from people saying like, why isn't this certified? Why why don't people get credit for this? All of our attorney populations, um, all of our attorney participation is down. So it was kind of, um, it was something that had been, had, that had been being requested. Um, and since we were going out with all these other changes, we thought that this would be the time to add that. When we went out for public comment, um, we did ask if there were other activities that we should consider um, qualifying, and we didn't hear much about what other types of activities should qualify, but I mean, it's not that we're, in, we're open to other things, but the, it had kind of been um, the, the mock trial people kind of took on a letter writing campaign even before, <laughs> even yes. before we decided to make this change. Um, so yeah, so they had been, they had been requesting this for quite some time. And since we were going out with a bunch of other changes, that's how, that, that was kind of the impetus for this. And 
you know, mock trial is great. I'm sure many of you have participated in it and maybe you would go back if you got an hour for MCLE. I don't know, but well, now that's, you, go that's ahead. where my question was going is if it's, if we're granting it because it's in support of pipelining issues and just being give back community service, are we granting it because we think mock trial and moot court has a substantive element that is a continuing yes. education element for the attorney? Because to me, I think there are other, like, I guess lecture sometimes. So like, if it's about using my substantive knowledge to pour back in to law students, if I'm not doing it through mock trial, but I'm doing it in some other way, I'm wondering if there's a broader category that requires certification from the law school that you came and did something in the service of the students so that I am incentivized to go help the students, but it may not necessarily be narrowly defined as support being a, a scorer in a mock trial. So I was just curious about that. Yeah, so this, so while this may incentive, incentivize attorney participation in mock trials, we believe that it's consistent with the goals of what um, continuing education provides. Um, specifically when, some, when attorneys getting ready to prepare for mock trial or to judge or score, they are required to review the cases, review rules of evidence, procedure, and to be willing to, you know, to be able to make the calls um, if they're acting as judge, whether, you know, so there is a, there is a legal benefit. Um, and we heard from so many different attorneys who maybe never were in the courtroom and they had to learn all this stuff to score. And for us, that's just as valuable as taking a course on civil procedure, you know? So it's kind of trying to think about the, the different ways that we learn. And the MCLE statutes are really based on like a lecture and we're really trying to explore, you know, what other ways our attorneys learning. And I would just say, you if you're um, being a guest lecturer at a law school, you can get MCLE for that as well. Oh, that's good to know. I'll go back and talk to them. Yeah, that's already. <laughs> yeah, Thank so you. that's. <laughs> We've so all learned just... something today. <laughs> So right, it's right. already <laughs> contemplated. It's already contemplated um, that, you know, that people, uh, that attorneys who are giving their time at the law school level can potentially receive MCLE credit for those activities. But I do think that, you know, this is just kind of part of the bar's broader initiative to really think about what we can do as preventative education. What does education really mean? What does education even look like anymore? I mean, after the pandemic, education is, everything looks really different, right? So I think we're trying to um, grapple with this and make something that's really going to work uh, for the licensees throughout the state. Thank you. I, I just want to add my um, support for a variety of reasons for these competitions receiving, um, receiving MCLE credit. And I'm so glad that middle schools have been added because there is a robust competition that happens, a mock trial competition that begins at the middle school or in, involves the middle school level that the, oh gosh, Constitution, whatever, Foundation. Yeah, right, foundation, constitution. Right, foundation. CRF, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And it is a phenomenal competition. The kids are better than many attorneys I know. And they have, for the past couple of years, had incredible difficulty finding enough judges for the amount of students like who want to participate. And so I'm so glad that it, it might be an ancillary, ancillary benefit, right? That it encourages participation in this and that it has this pipelining impact, but it, it certainly will. And I'm so glad. And I mean, at the law school level, we have difficulty sometimes getting people to be willing to be scorers or judges from court competitions because it is time out of people's work days and it's not billable. So again, to the extent that it's an ancillary benefit, I'm so happy. With, and it is a lot of work. And do I get right. credit if I write those problems? <laughs> no, you're not going to get credit. Well, they're also a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> Does everybody have Kathy's email if they have MCLE questions? I'm sorry. I went way too long, Elizabeth. I apologize. <laughs> I told her I was going to be so quick. Oh, I know. I already texted and said, this is more than 15 minutes. <laughs> 
question or comment? It's a short question, Kathy, and it's back to thank you for all the information, but I want to go back to the civility oath question. Mm -hmm. And my there's the example of what does not count as a violation. Are there examples or contemplated examples of what would constitute a violation or would we be waiting for state bar decisions essentially to flesh that out? Yeah, I don't think that that's been fleshed out and I don't think it's going to be fleshed out necessarily in the statutes. I mean, well, in the in the rules. Um, yeah, but I, I'll look into it and see. But um, just from what I know so far, I don't think so. But I'll ask because it's really uh, my colleague's item and she okay. has all the in-depth, but I can ask her. Kathy, may I add that I think something that might address some of those bias and civility concerns is for, I am sure, I think on the attorney discipline presentations that we had, there were, um, there was information given about increased training, both bias and others that were being given to investigators mm -hmm. um, in that, but just particularly around the ways that tone policing and weaponization might happen that increased training for the investigators on that includes some of those more specific sub areas as well as why it is not in civil to address behavior that is discriminatory but it is in fact incredibly important to our profession and so just training in that for those who are conducting those investigations and receiving those reports i think would be very important um, going forward, assuming this is adopted and put into practice. No, I think that's a great comment. Um, and if you want to send that in an email, I could add it to the public comments. Okay. <laughs> Adding to my or you could submit it right on the website. It doesn't matter either one, but I think that that's a really, I think that that's, I mean, that's something that we're definitely going to be building in. Um, but it's um, something that I sh I'm sure the board of trustees would also like to know. Anything else for Kathy? Thank you, Kathy, as always. All right. I'm for sorry I took all the hard work. Nope, you're, Friday, you're fine. It's really Friday. important stuff, and we are incredibly grateful that you are, you are here um, and that you made the presentation. So please don't think about that at all. And if anybody has any questions or concerns, or if you think about anything later and you have questions, just feel free to email me. You can reach, if you don't have my information, Elizabeth can give it to you. And thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, thank you Kathy. Okay. Um, next on our agenda, Erica, you are here. I see you um, on the implicit bias MCLE module. Yeah. Thanks, Judge Kristen. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, just a really quick update on the implicit bias online MCLE module. Um, I know at the last meeting we had given an update on sort of the first year since its launch and the numbers that came in, we had over 12,000 participants in the first year. Um, we're still seeing uh, about 250 to 300 participants per month currently. And then as we know, there'll probably be a spike towards the end of the year. So we're happy with those numbers. Um, the working group uh, for this module is Novella and Angelica. And we had met to brainstorm some ideas um, about whether to make improvements to the current course or to think of uh, future course topics to start working on now. Um, it looks like we're leaning more towards uh, making improvements to the current online course. So things um, that have been discussed previously, we're making it maybe more interactive or more tailored to people's actual experience and in uh, the legal profession or in legal office settings, um, including survey questions to get more of a sense of people's familiarity with the topic, and um, maybe creating additional modules based uh, or tiered to people's um, experience with the topic already, so that it could be a little bit more advanced for folks who have had exposure to implicit bias training previously. Um, so the, the next steps right now are for us to um, reach out to our vendor to understand a little bit more about what can actually be achieved and on what timeline. And then staff is going to come back to the working group with a proposal um, and get some responses and reactions to that and then uh, move forward based on uh, their guidance. So that's the update for now. Thanks, Erica. Uh, Novella, anything you wanted to add to that? Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will just point out again, this is another uh, brilliant brainchild of COAF. 
this online MCLE. Um, so thank you, uh, Erica for, and Novella and Angelica, who's not here, um, for all your work you've done on this. Um, and that's, I mean, it's great that that many people are taking it in, in uh, every month. So thank you for all your hard work on that. Uh, okay. Uh, Elizabeth tells me that now I should be facilitating a discussion on any other <laughs> um, DEI initiatives um, that folks have uh, thoughts on because we're not doing enough and we can always do more. Um, so if anybody else has anything, um, any ideas for stuff that we could be doing that COF could be doing, now it uh, would be a great time to throw that out. You're all overwhelmed. That's all we're doing already. Well, you don't have to. So if you think of something, oh, oh, we have two hands Heather's raised. Thought, <laughs> Heather's, thought, Heather's thought of something. Good. I, I don't have an idea for something more we could be doing at this time, but I do <laughs> still want to figure out how we get more publicity for what we have done. I feel like. I obviously am very tapped in, not only because I sit in these meetings, but because I follow the state bar and I get, you know, all of those reminders. But how do we, I'm, I'm open to brainstorming how we just make sure these 237,000 licensed, you know, attorneys know that all of this great work is being done. I think that's a great question. And, um, and you know, I, I, I think... Um, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, that COF does a tremendous amount of work um, and tremendously important work. And so I don't know, but maybe maybe that's something that we can think about uh, down the line. And maybe that's something that Sarah, now that she's on the board of trustees, uh, can help us with is, you know, how, how do we how do we get out um, the message on some of this stuff that we've been doing? Um, and get the state bar some good press on this. Because Lord knows we could use it, right? Yeah, I don't know if there's like some kind of monthly, and maybe we already have something like this again, because I feel like I get information from different sources that might be conflating it all, but um, like some kind of monthly top five, these are the things that, you know, we've been up to. Um, or some kind of TikTok influencer that like spreads the word. I'm, I'm open to all kind of creative ways, but it just, I'm so proud of everything that we do here. And I just wanna make sure it's, you know, amplified in the proper way. So. Yeah, I have Facebook and that's it. And I'm not- Me too. <laughs> uh, and LinkedIn. <laughs> So I'm the wrong person for this, but Heather's the right person for this. <laughs> <laughs> Only to throw out the, the concepts and then have experts right. really think about it. But I do think that, yeah, we, figuring out or having maybe a, a working group that kind of focuses on working with the comms team or mm -hmm. figuring out how to help them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, I said this to Elizabeth when I read the annual report to the legislature and, and, and I, I responded to her to the really long report that she wrote that was amazing. And I said, you know, when you see it all in writing, how much COAF does and how much the Office of Action, Access and Inclusion does, it, it's really mind boggling and, and no one really knows anything about it. Um, and, and so it, it would be nice for, you know, the Office of Access and Inclusion and the State Bar to, to really get some light shed on, on this. I mean, maybe there's, is there not even an article somewhere in the, the Daily Journal? I feel like Ryan and I have been in the Daily Journal uh, plenty, not for any of the <laughs> right reasons necessarily, but um, it would be nice to have, you know, at least some, some good coverage. And I think we focus a lot on ensuring that lawyers and law students, you know, are aware of what we do and, and we could even be doing better there. But if we're serving clients, which is the public, yeah. maybe something that allows them to know all the great things we're doing. So they're like, oh, wow, the lawyers in my state are, you know, held to these standards are doing these great things. And that's going to make them better prepared to serve me when I need one. Yeah, if oh, I can add, that. I want to just add to that, that that kind of ties into where my hand up was, which is not necessarily a um, 
it wasn't an idea, but just a concern for co-op to keep in mind, which is that at this point, I made a flippant joke about it, but I think the reality is that many people feel as if a commitment to the important ideals of access and inclusion and standing against injustice and harassment and discrimination are very much under attack societally. And so I that was part of my thought is both how can we continue to, is there a way that COAF can continue to, through the, the leadership SEAL program or others, support and encourage organizations, firms, employers, and individual attorneys who are feeling like they may be alone in standing against some of those things, but also to the marketing point to show the public that at least in California, the legal profession, regardless of where people may sit ide ideologically, so I don't know what this means for the board of trustees, but that the profession is committed to the highest ideals of access to justice and that justice is something that's equitably ap applied across at least the state. And that might go hand in hand with publicizing some of this really great work around things like even fair lawyer discipline, right? Like mm -hmm. I want a good lawyer. I also want to know that if a lawyer does something wrong, that there's fair standards of discipline. I think there's so many ways that the public good can be served here, not the least of which is restoring confidence in the rule of law and that right. it's something that marginalized people, historically excluded people can find solace in and can turn to when they're being um, harassed and discriminated against. Sorry, that sounds like a campaign speech. No. I apologize. <laughs> I'm not. You should, uh, although for the beginning of a good publicity campaign. <laughs> That's what it is. But I, but I think you're both right. I mean, I think that, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, as I said many times today, we do amazing work and it would be nice for, for folks to see that. And I think you're right, you know, uh, Shalak, that, you know, the rule of law is under attack and there's no question about it. And, um, and the public lacks confidence and there are good reasons why. And um, what, whatever we can do to fix that, I think is, you know, as a group is worth doing. Um, so, as, Danielle, oh, as Danielle mentioned earlier, we are meeting with our communications team about the leadership seal specifically next week. So I will bring this up kind of as a larger conversation with them to let them know that um, there is some interest from COAF to yeah. um, maybe expand on that yeah. um, beyond the seal. I was thinking about what other professions do a good job of that, right? And I was like thinking about the medical profession, and and this may be specific to certain providers, let's say a Kaiser or you know, um, or Optum or something. But like, I feel like PR campaigns that just show we have caring doctors that are diverse and do all these things so that you feel like you can find care. And as a consumer, like that gives me some comfort, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we like make sure the public knows we're, these teams ensure that you get that same kind of professionalism from the lawyers in this state because we implement these kinds of, you know, initiatives, so. No, I like it. I like it. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up, both of you. Um, Anybody else have thoughts? Anything they want to add? I don't want to forget. Um, we have our, um, I think that <laughs> Judge Dolce has patiently been here with us all day. Uh, we are so grateful, um, Judge, that you are here with us and you stay through the whole thing every time. Um, and I feel like we always make you last on the agenda. Um, but but thank you for being here and for listening uh, to all of our um, information. and. If you have anything to share from the Judicial Council, we would love to hear it. Um, I do, but I, I do wanna just kind of follow up on what you've said, Jud Rosie, because it really is um, amazing the work that your council does. Uh, I'm proud to be the liaison and I enjoy listening to your business meetings. I know I could just schedule a time in to update you all, um, but it's, the work that you all do is amazing. And that ties in with your last conversation. You should promote the good work that you're doing. I, I like Judge Rossi, we're of the same generation. I think, um, you know, Facebook is about it, but um, that's not true for today's generation. When you're speaking about the public and about your new young lawyers, they're, you know, they're, they're computer-based, they wanna know. And 
I always do my homework. And when I was appointed to this committee, I you know went on the state bar website and what's there for the council. I have to tell you, there's not much on your committee. You could be you could be touting your work just on the on the web, the state bar's website, a link to the good work that you're doing. Um, because it really is admirable and you should all be proud to be part of it. And the discussions that you have, and I know the hard work that go in behind them are really important. Um, let me give you a quick update on our counterpart, which is the um, Judicial Council's um, providing access, Advisory Committee on Providing Access and Fairness. Our, um, we also have to have an annual agenda process and our annual agenda was just passed in March by the Judicial Council and is available on our website to review. If anyone's interested, it's under the um, California Courts website, under the uh, Judicial Council tab, under Advisory Committee's um, PATH for short, Providing Access and Fairness. So um, some of our um, accomplishments recently have been through our Language Access Subcommittee, um, and they had two projects um, of note recently. One is the Signage and Technology Grant Program, which is ongoing. Um, like last year, our language access services programs partnered with our Judicial Council Information Technology to release a single online application for four judicial branch technology related programs and grants. One is an IT modernization fund program um, for courts to apply to. The other is language access signage and technology grant. There's a jury management systems grant and there's a model self-help technology grant program. Our courts had until April 21st to apply and the um, subcommittee will present a report um, at our next PATH meeting, which is I believe uh, June 15th. So um, again, ideas and programs are great. Um, money to help those programs uh, is what makes them go forward. The second um, uh, project for our language access subcommittee is public outreach for the online California court self-help guide. Um, this project is to help ensure um, that multilingual resources on the newly redesigned California court self-help guide, including new remote appearance uh, materials are reaching limited English proficient communities. The materials include assistance for self-represented litigants, including infographics, flyers, brochures, videos, and public service announcements. Um, and our online self-help guide will house these multilingual materials through the development of a new language drop-down menu feature. The languages will include Arabic, Chinese, both simplified and traditional, Farsi, Korean, Punjabi, Russian, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. And the entire self-help guide has been translated into Spanish. Um, again, you, you can hear that online um, component of all of this in the, in the computer access that our public so um, greatly wants and needs. Um, coming up also is a panel at the California Lawyers Association's annual meeting, which is September 21st to the 23rd in 2023. PATH will be co-sponsoring a panel relating to increasing judicial diversity and the different pathways to the bench, along with our justice partner, CLA, and the California Judges Association. We are still um, trying to round up some volunteer judges and justices, particularly those uh, that are in the, and around the San Diego area. If anyone is interested in that or knows a judge that they would like to send our way, they can contact our lead counsel for PATH at the Judicial Council and I have her contact information if you want. And that is an in-person um, conference to be held in San Diego this coming fall. So we're looking forward to participation in that as well. Um, so that's our quick update from the Judicial Council. And again, I um, cannot reiterate how much um, I think the work that you all are doing is amazing. I would have loved to have had um, that type of resource available. I won't tell you how many years ago when I was a young lawyer wondering, can I do this? Can I really do this? Um, uh, it would have been nice to have these resources a click away telling me why yes, as a matter of fact, you can. And here's 30 second you know, video testimony. Um, on that note, I know you all were talking about young lawyers. Um, I recently have been trying to reconnect with my local bar association and I went to one of their meetings. And I know that that's probably more pertinent for your video testimonials, but I just remind you that our chief justice has an amazing story, an absolutely amazing story. And if you all could land a testimonial from her, I think that would be great. Yeah.
And she did share briefly the, uh, or for about a year, the Blue Ribbon Commission um, yeah. before she had to step off. Um, so um, she, she knows she's already on the list. a lot about the hard work the State Bar is doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Justice Guerrero is always a, a good choice too. Yes. Great. Thank you, uh, Judge Dilchitz, for being here. And um, again, we, I, I really do appreciate that you are, I know you could just pop in and you don't and you stay the whole time and it, it does uh, mean a great deal to all of us that that you're here. And so thank you for for um, for being here this whole time. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, I don't see Lauren anymore, Elizabeth, unless you can see her and I can't. And I don't see Pam, um, although I'm not sure I saw Pam at all. Um, so I don't think that I have anything left on the agenda unless uh, folks here have something. Nope. Okay. I don't need a motion to adjourn, do I? I don't. Okay. Well, then I will wish um, all of you a, a lovely weekend. Thank you all for being here um, all day on, uh, on this uh, and for doing all the hard work. I apologize for those of you in LA. I am so sad I'm not having dinner with you or, or an early, I don't know what you're doing, a late lunch. <laughs> anymore but um but next time i will be there um it's so good to see you all please stay safe and well uh and we will see each other again uh in august thank you thank you bye, bye everybody bye. safe trip back michael <laughs> thank you